Well, hello. It's time to start uh, what I what I've been planning on being like a uh, I don't know Tuesday and Thursday time some live streaming. You can see I need to make some adjustments. Let me move my camera so that I can maintain the illusion of you know like being in a studio. Ooh, see now it's gone. Anyhow, uh, I live here in Amsterdam. And most of my coworkers who are doing this streaming, they live in what they call the States. Interesting thing I've always noticed now that I live here is if you're in America, as we call it, no one calls it the States. You're not back home. You're like, ooh, the States are nice. It's always called America. But for some reason, once you leave America, it's called the States, which I suppose makes sense. You know, it's always great when uh, people outside of your culture pedantically tell you things like, well, it is the United States of America and America is a whole region. But whatever, people call it the States. I'm not really sure why that's relevant. But back to the main point. Most of the things they do are when I am uh, eating dinner or sleeping. And uh, since I'm here in Amsterdam, in EMEA, as they say, I thought we should have some content for uh, over here. So this being the first show, you know, one of my rules, let me adjust the camera a little bit more, but one of my, uh, one of my rules for doing content is you don't talk about uh, the show and the meta stuff, but I'm gonna allow myself a little bit that first. So I'm going to try to do this uh, at 11 a.m. I think they call it Central European time or Amsterdam time uh, at 11. I don't know. Is that a good time? I don't really know what the work habits of Europeans are because uh, I'm from the States. Uh, But I figure that's sort of like a lunchtime. Maybe 1130 is better. But maybe nowadays no one cares and they just stream stuff all the time. You tell me. But I'll try to do that on Tuesdays and Thursdays because, see, Tanzu starts with T, and those are two T days, as I call them. And let me check. You got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. No no other day starts with with T. I also think of, like, June and July as the J months in the calendar. I get very confused about calendars and time. But I'll do it then, and I'll do the additional uh, scheduled things we have where uh, Rita and I or other people kind of one-off interviews, uh, and we'll try to broadcast those as well. But what I was thinking of doing is luckily I have several decades experience just talking about nothing at length and rambling. Uh, So I'll try to do a little bit of curation and just talk about uh, things I've noticed that are interesting that I think are relevant to the uh, whoever might tune into this. And uh, my dog can, as always, can contribute some more uh, to this. She's 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 a great co-worker. She notifies me when uh, packages arrive. But to that end, uh, I don't know. I'll figure it out and get around to it. I was thinking I need to come up with some flashy uh, graphics. There's actually some design people working on stuff like that. In the meantime, uh, I've got some basic setup stuff. So with that, let me let me take care of the dog here. I think she just needs some attention, and then uh, and then maybe she'll she'll be okay. We'll we'll find out what happens. Also, uh, I'm monitoring the chat window, so I can chat and do things. Uh, I think that's thrilling. Uh, I, I love I love the chatting. Here I am talking about the show again. Well, let me uh, let me go over the first thing. And I was thinking it'd be nice if I could hook my iPad up to this, but um, you know the dog keeps trying to tell me how to do it, but I'm I'm just I'm just not going to listen. Anyways, I was uh, we were going over yesterday, uh, kind of a recap of some of our events at Spring One Platform, and I of course uh, mentioned a talk that Jana Werner had done. Now, I've been mentioning her a lot recently and talking about her content because she has great things to say and I've done an interview with her and other things. But I was remembering one part of uh, discussions that we've had and uh, the talk that she was giving there, uh, which was basically one point of it was that you have to remember that if you're you're in your organization and you're trying to uh, change how it's operating, you're trying to transform, as we like to say in the business, the way that uh, software is done, and, uh, you know, kind of get to the point where you're acting like a tech company with your software. I should do a segment one time where I can just define what that means, doing that transforming and getting better at software and just refer back to it because it's really tiresome. But let's just say improve the way that your organization does software. As you're needing to like change the organization structure and how people operate, you're suggesting all of these big changes to improve. Most people are gonna think you're a lunatic. Right, like something seems crazy uh, at first until it gets widely accepted. Uh, right, like there's that old Apple thing of like you know, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing it, but like you know, this goes out to all the crazy people. Um, 
Now, I have a formulation. I remember there was uh, one of my older friends. He had his own consultancy, his own software uh, consultancy. He's had it forever. And uh, at one point, there were several years where he was not making too much money. And, uh, you know, he had a, a family to support. And uh, people were always asking, like, why, why doesn't he just go? He's a programmer. Why doesn't he just go get a nice job at a big place? And, of course, he wanted to be an independent uh, worker. And that's when I came up with this, you know, one of my little uh, silly phrases, which is basically it's only stupid until it works. And I think, you know, I think about that a lot as far as uh, – not so much to justify stupid things that I do, but to, as, as I'm doing right now, kind of calm myself down about how you've got to just always try out new things, and it's going to seem crazy until you get it right, until it works. And I think that's, that's the phrasing I have for this, like, you know, beware that you seem crazy when you're telling people how to uh, change things. But I think, I think more than that realization, if you're one of these change agents, what's important to do is to have some empathy for these people that you're trying to change. Now, uh, coming from a programmer background, having empathy for people who don't listen to you and can't obviously see the better way of doing things, we have no tolerance for that. We're very like, uh, we almost believe in this, uh, I always call this kind of like the platonic fallacy. Uh, maybe not platonic, but but when I was studying Plato and a lot of philosophers, they always had this huge flaw in their reasoning for is an eon a thousand year millennia for thousands of years which was that if you if you could set up a reasoning you know like like uh you know some aristotelian logic some platonic stuff of if this then that and therefore that they would somehow believe that if you rationalized out why you should believe something that people would look at it and believe it which i think that doesn't really happen people you just often are not convinced of things they often have to experience it firsthand and have more uh, kind of an emotional firsthand experience involvement with it so I think with that kind of understanding, you can't really sort of like uh, prove out that doing things in an agile way would be better, right? It's, I, I imagine it's quite difficult, for example, to go to the finance department and say, like, uh, if we do uh, smaller increments of software, we're always coming up with a theory of software. We're going to validate it by deploying it and get, uh, you know, input from people. And therefore, you as finance people uh, will be able to actually manage risk better and manage our, our investments better. Like, they're not going to care, right? They have no experience with that. They probably don't even know people, uh, peers of theirs, who have done that. So somehow you have to involve them in having firsthand experience and seeing success uh, to kind of believe that what seems lunacy, uh, you know, works for them. That is, right? Like, it's, it's only stupid until it works. So I think, I think that's, a, that's like a mindset shift. I don't quite have figured out, as you can tell. That's why I'm talking about it so much. But that I think is an important thing to look at is, is that you're suggesting doing things in a new way. No one is, is going to trust it. It seems crazy. They may not even really aspire to the goal that you have. And so you've got to somehow figure out how to understand to motivate them to do it. And I think there's a few competing factors working there. One is like we have this phrase in the States. I don't know if they have it elsewhere, but uh, I guess it uses the word ain't, so it must be an Americanism. But it's basically like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this has been an overriding notion, I think, in life and engineering for a long time. And so when you're going in there and asking people to change, if there's not some crisis, right, if it's not broke, why would you fix something? So that's kind of the first thing is like there needs to be some some motivation, some uh, some crisis to respond to. Now, I think this is really hard in large organizations because any individual that you're asking to change is usually pretty isolated from crisis. Right. And uh, they're, they're kind of like crisis affects them the least. Uh, it might affect management and people above that. The uh, whoever this shareholder is, I'm never really sure. You know, I'm by nature of index fund shareholders in a lot of companies and I would appreciate it if they got better at software that would be fine I, 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 I as a shareholder I advocate improving the way that you do software so I can speak on behalf of uh, odd shareholders maybe I'm isolated through those index funds and, and buffeted through it so maybe my voice doesn't count I should talk to the um, the fund managers because they might be the shareholder I don't know I get confused but I'm pretty sure the shareholders want you to do software better uh, as as I recall. So anyhow, you know, you've got all these layers and eventually you get to an individual in a 10, 100,000, 200,000 person company and like I'm never really sure that they directly connect together with this imperative for change. So again, you've got to be empathetic and talk about how their life will be better, right? Like how things will be better for them if uh, you switch over to a more agile 
whatever kind of way of doing things and, and think about how you appeal to them. Otherwise, again, it will seem stupid or, uh, or lunacy. But I think, again, and this is something, you know, I'm, I'm ongoing working on is, uh, I don't know, be more empathetic to the, the, the people, figure out what's, what's their motivation for changing. So to close that out, this, I've been thinking about, you know, um, I've been writing these little, uh, as I always joke, as O'Reilly likes to call them reports, but as the rest of the world calls them books, those little free booklets with the funny covers from O'Reilly. Uh, and I realized I've done one uh, a year for the last two years, so I should start working on one uh, for this year. And, I, and I'm tentatively thinking of calling it uh, mindset. That is sort of like, what are those, those ways of thinking uh, that people, that you need to realize you're having if you wanna change the way your organization works in the software sense? Um, and like, what are some tactics people use for them? Because, you know, I have sort of a blind spot in the, uh, the content that I do where if it's not, you know, ironically with my refutation of that kind of uh, platonic way of thinking, if it's not sort of laid out in a proof with uh, backing tactics and kind of like something you can put on a chart, I tend to be dismissive of it. Dismissive of it. Now, I don't know what they call these things. Back in, in my day, they used to call these um, soft things, right? Soft skills or... Or, or whatever, but I think it's kind of, you're relying on an intuitive argument for it. Uh, or to use another kind of phrase, you need, in order to believe it and practice it, you need to take a leap of faith. And I've always found that a lot of stuff in the, uh, the DevOps and the, the digital transformation in the agile world kind of requires this leap of faith to just believe you should do it, right? Like we should be a learning organization. That's actually a good example, right? So. Uh, you know, one of one of my old uh, friends in the industry, Andrew Schaefer. He's he's always been the advocate of this. Like, you know, if you're, uh, I forget what, the, you know, he he lo he loves the, um, I forget what you call this kind of thing, but the kind of phrase where you say, if not, if you're not in state A, you will be uh, beaten or killed by a competitor who is in state A. So therefore, you should adopt state A. And so, you know, one of one of the ways he used to play with that all the time is that if you're not a learning organization, you will lose to a learning organization. And so learning is one of these interesting things where, like, you sort of understand, you're told by all these, uh, these agile-y, DevOps-y people that you need to be a learning organization. And you constantly need to be learning. And so you should shift over to that way of doing things. Now, you go back to the way that you operate where... You're used to being a, when it comes to software, a feature implementing organization, a keep the service up and running organization, a delivery organization, right? You're delivering a set of services and all of a sudden you're being told you need to be a learning organization. And I don't know, that just sounds like lunacy, right? Like it doesn't really even make sense. Now, of course, uh, it does make sense. And that's kind of like the culmination of a whole of, what is this? Probably about 10 years of thinking about how you do software better and how you uh, make sure that IT is actually delivering value, actually doing something that's helpful for the organization. And so I never really sit around and proclaim like you should be a learning organization because it's hard to kind of prove that out. But I think, I think there are a lot of things like that that are just like, well, you just have to believe that thing. You need to have a mindset shift. And so I want to start cataloging what these, uh, these mindset things are. And I don't quite know what that means yet. Maybe, maybe uh, next time. I talk here, I'll kind of go over the outline that I have so far, but I think that's a good, a good first one to start noodling around with is that, uh, the first mindset shift, maybe ironically you have to have is everyone's going to think your mindset is crazy and belongs in, uh, you know, the loony bin. I, I don't know what one would say nowadays. So the second thing I wanted to go over. So the, uh, this morning, uh, I was, I, I read a, uh, a, you know, I use this thing called a uh, nuzzle, which I think has turned into a, uh, one of those just kind of like helping people sell more ads and targeting stuff, things in the great machine of having you buy stuff. You know, I fell prey to one of those the other day there. I don't know if you've seen this in Instagram, but there's Halloween's coming up and there's this like old man mask that looks really cool. Uh, and I saw an Instagram and I ordered it. And now oddly enough, I see that ad over and over again, but I realized the problem with this old man mask is going to be this gigantic beard uh, that I have. It's probably not going to fit so well, but I'll try. Because the, 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 the guy they have demoing it, he's a complete cue ball. He's all, he's all shaved on top and, and um, in the chin area, so maybe it does fit snugly. 
And, you know, knowing the way that these ads work, they probably put some sort of adhesive inside that makes it adhere and some, uh, some stuff like that. But whatever, it'll be fun. You know, Hunter Thompson used to have all these masks he would run around with, and uh, maybe that would be enjoyable. We'll see how it works. Anyhow, nuzzle probably is used just to target people like me to do that. But it's also the, the original purpose of it was great. Like it looks at your Twitter uh, sort of lists and followers, and it kind of extracts out the best links that are in there. So I saw a link this morning. It was uh, by Tim Anderson over at the Register. He's he's uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've not done the analysis, but I'm pretty sure he's been writing more than he used to. Um, and he's done a, a, a great job at kind of cataloging what's going on in the development area. I will, you know, one thing I need to do is be better at putting these things here. But in, in the in the if you go, I'm going to put this in the chat. Here's a link to my little tweet about that. But he's been doing these things where he visits conferences and he writes up uh, talks that people are giving there. And somewhere, Sam Newman, the microservices person, I think I saw him talk at a QCon or InfoQ. Those are the same thing, right? I wonder what the Q stands for. Uh, would it be quality, conference, info? Maybe it's a Q, like a uh, list of things to look at. Anyhow, uh, and it looks like he went over a talk where basically Sam Newman was like, you know, you shouldn't uh, spend, developers shouldn't be spending all their time on Kubernetes. Serverless is where they should be spending their time. Now, I saw a microservices talk uh, because he's written a microservices book by him. And, you know, I don't mean this in a uh, in a bad negative way, but like it, it it reminded me of a certain genre of microservices talk where it's basically like slide one, just so we all understand, you should never do microservices, and then it's like slide one to eighty. Here's how to do microservices, which is which is you know remember that Martin Fowler thing that you know you must be high to ride this ride. I think I think when you tell developers that they should not do something, it's just like when you tell a six year old. Uh, that they shouldn't do something, right? Immediately they're like, sounds like a challenge. I need to go figure that out. So maybe this idea of telling, I think it's almost like maybe when you tell developers they shouldn't do something because it's too complicated, it's almost like this unintentional signaling that you'd be really cool if you can figure this out, which is kind of the hazards of uh, telling people uh, not to do something. I think they call that the challenger sale. I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Anyhow, it got me, you know, the, so, so, it's it's a good piece. You should go to look it up. And I think I think especially being at a vendor that sells something like a, a Cloud Foundry instance and a Kubernetes distro, we love it when people say that developers shouldn't care about uh, Kubernetes and they shouldn't work with it directly. But it did get me thinking this morning. Like, is it actually the case that like a distressing amount of developers are like hand building Kubernetes things on their own and like are they really like paying attention to building platforms? I mean, that's that's an assumption I've had. Um, let me calculate again. This is 2020. So 10 years ago would be 2010. So basically, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, I kind of had this assumption when I was a developer, I like to build platforms. Like I like to build the framework, not the actual application. And all of my, my peers and my friends, including the one who uh, helped me come up with this idea that it's only stupid to, till it works. Uh, he built his own frame. He's built his own framework numerous times. Uh, I've even interviewed him about them. And then I had another friend who built their own framework. Basically, every developer uh, builds their own framework, their own platforms over and over again. I had a great friend in high school, built his own programming language uh, and parser. You know, I'm saying he. I wonder if, if, if like other genders build their own frameworks, or if this is some uniquely like uh, stressed out male thing. It's that, that would be an interesting thing to uh, go study. I, you know, there'd be no conclusion. It's just sort of like another cut at the data to uh, ponder at. So I've always assumed that developers want to build their own thing. And then, of course, you had Docker uh, come along. Uh, and they wanted to build their own stuff. And back in the OpenStack days, people would uh, build their own things a lot. But it got me wondering. Nowadays, like, are there a lot of developers building out Kubernetes in a distressing way? Or is it one of those things where we're just making a uh, mountain out of a molehill? Um, now, I went and uh, looked up, I tried to look at some survey data. This information is a little sparse. So, you know, I don't have anything conclusive, but we'll stick with the nature of just being uh, footloose and fancy free. Now I've prepared, speaking of meta talk, pardon me having some, but I'm just disclaiming in case something goes wrong. Look at that. I have prepared a way that I can share uh, some information with you. Now, let me move this over here. So what we got here, I, I'm going to expand this out. I've been trying to use, uh, you know, I'm always trying to find something better than Evernote. 
I really would just like to use Evernote if it relied on flat files and just uh, allowed me to use Markdown and, and not like, I think basically if Evernote had flat files and uh, uh, a hierarchical structure, I would definitely go back to using it. I've been using it since 2008 and I always return to it kind of sort of, but I don't know. I don't know. Either that or if drafts had uh, had more flat files. Anyways, that's that's a conversation for another time. But just in case you're wondering, this is what Devon Note looks like. It's, it's a little, it has its own issues. But, so what I wanted to collect together is kind of look at, uh, let's see some information and kind of validate this idea that developers are spending too much time paying attention to Kubernetes. Now, first of all, the argument is, I'm going to call this DIY. That's what we in the vendor world call it when people choose to build their own stuff from open source rather than pay us for their uh, their distros. They probably call that in the public cloud world, right, that they're doing DIY stuff. Do it yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, a related concept is uh, NIH, not invented here, which is that it would be interesting to see the Venn diagram. Very, very overlappy there. So anyways, I went and looked... Uh, you know, I squirrel away a bunch of these uh, these reports and PDFs, and I went and searched, and I remembered that in the uh, the State of Spring survey, there uh, there was some usage about Spring Boot developers, right? Where are they? Where are they running uh, uh, their Spring Boot stuff? And a huge amount of them, as you can see, have are you know containerizing them, but already running it in Kubernetes, and there's even more planning to deploy it to Kubernetes. Uh, I love the too soon to say. I, I love those those uh, those those small slices there. And then of course there's the 11 percent not planning to deploy to Kubernetes. Now, despite this being from the organization I work for, uh, maybe I should go back and ask this. But I don't know the details of what that means running in Kubernetes. Is that any distro running in public private cloud, or or what have you? But this this so this doesn't quite address the uh, DIY thing. But it does show. Uh, at least among the, uh, I think it's several thousand people that were surveyed in this survey. You can, uh, you know, go look it up if you really care. Uh, but it basically does show that developers are interested in, uh, you know, running their, containerizing their stuff and running on Kubernetes, which, which is great, I think, for all of us. If you're watching this, you probably care about containers uh, and things like that. So that's a, a trend going that way. So we can't establish that there is developer interest in that, right? Now, what this doesn't really tell us is like, so are they running on top of like raw Kubernetes that they're managing and directly uh, manipulating it and setting up all of the um, the doohickeys and wing dingles and things like that? That would be great, the Kubernetes wing dingles. We can go over that at some point. But it does show interest. So next, there's two kind of use cases, I think, to kind of, kind of validate these things. Let me let me start with this uh, this first one here. Let's see. I forget what the highlight is. Whoa! Now you're going to lose track of that. Let me see what the, uh, the highlighting color is. Uh, oh, yeah. That kind of works. I'll have to improve this. Zooming in, I'm sure, would be helpful. But so here is, there's, so this is a great, uh, uh, so BT, I'm sure, I don't know if it's, Formerly BT, or you know British Telecom, they operate in in the UK. There, they're they're a, a customer of ours for quite some time, and uh, I've actually been lucky enough to kind of work with the platform team there, the ones who build uh, the the container platform that they're using uh, to to redo things. And there's a great interview uh, with Rajesh here uh, in Infoworld. He did a, a good a good keynote at uh, Spring One this year. You can look up. He's done a lot of interviews around how they're improving, how they're doing software. And he kind of raises the sentiment uh, when it comes to enterprise use of, of Kubernetes, right? That you kind of don't, it's not a good idea, back to the idea of building, uh, you know, developers building their own platforms. You don't really want to let them manage that stuff on their own and build that container. And I think this is, this is an important thing that comes, that starts to change into enterprise uh, container usage, enterprise Kubernetes usage is if you think about an organization like BT or other ones where you've got uh, even larger ones, thousands and thousands of developers all working on the applications. You've got a bevy of, of older applications that you need to modernize. You start to have this need maybe to freak you out a little bit for enterprise architecture and governance, right? There's a lot of efficiencies that you need to achieve by having standardized shared ways of doing things. And equally importantly, there's a lot of things that you need to do. There's a lot of policy, ways of doing things, ways of not doing things. 
you can't sort of just let everyone decide to do things their own way, right? So you've got to kind of uh, work as a team, collaborate on governance. And collaboration, you know, also means following governance, not just being the ones who define it and uh, are, are innovating it. I mean, talk about an idea that seems stupid until it works, right? If you went to the uh, the cool kids and you were like, enterprise architecture, good idea, they would probably tell you it looks stupid until it works uh, at scale. That's That's a snarky joke, I guess. But you can see, and this is a sentiment that, uh, you know, we hear that I hear a lot from uh, people in uh, Rajesh's position go over, right? That like, if we allow all these groups uh, or encourage them to build their own platforms, it kind of like they end up focusing on the wrong challenges. And then, um, you know, what other people will tell me is you end up having to maintain uh, those, those stacks and those platforms that you have. And there's even, you know, I realize all of this comes from someone whose uh, bills get paid by a vendor who uh, is paid to uh, replace these problems for you. So it can seem a bit funny, but there are, uh, you know, there's lots of organizations I talk with who obviously don't want to be named, who have spent a year and millions of dollars in staffing to try to build their own platform. And they end up with a platform that kind of sort of works, uh, but like often doesn't work fully well. And uh, those people often leave and, you know, you've created a legacy platform for yourself, which can be maintained. But imagine not only doing that as one centralized platform, but one thing that I've realized recently is, especially in large organizations, and I'm sure uh, this doesn't happen in your organization, uh, but I've heard people uh, who, who do that. What, what occurs is you've got multiple large organizations and they often have competing fractions, uh, two, three, 10 people, organizations across the globe who are building their own platform and they're all advocating for their containerized way of doing it. And I mean, frankly, <clears throat> that's stupid, right? Like the organization is spending a lot of time because they can't just all sit down at the table and decide on, I don't know, two ways of doing it. So you've got all these competing ways of doing things, and it really like doesn't help anyone at the end of the day. So not only do you have one effort to build of, of one organization building their own container platform, their own stack, their own replacement for the old middleware stack that they've had, but now you have multiple of them and all the multiple problems that come with that, which I don't know. Back to the, uh, back to the you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, I think I think a part of that is a lot of people assume in organizations that everyone is aligned to the strategy of the organization. But I think for most people working in an organization, the point is for them to like have a job and have something to do all day. And, uh, you know, they'll just come up with stuff to do that seems to make sense for them. So if what makes sense is like for that organization to build their own platform, they may feel that their, their short-term interests are much better served for coming up with their own thing rather than sort of uh, working on behalf of the company. I don't know. Just a wild theory there for you. So anyways, you see this sentiment, uh, this kind of need, uh, you know, represented here, but that basically, like, you do need to have some centralized way of thinking about the container stack, the platform that you're building. Uh, and similarly, even, you know, here's another thing from, uh, it's behind uh, the 451 paywall. I, I used to work there. Uh, they have they have great stuff, but there's there's a uh, a write up that William Fellows did, one of the original four five one uh, research people, now an S and P company, as I recall. Um, but you know it's it's notable for several things. One, it's on topic, but two, it's the bank I use here in the Netherlands, ABN or ABN Amro, as as I'm sure you're uh, supposed to say. But he did a, a quick little profile of their centralized uh, team who built uh, and manages their container platform, their Kubernetes inst instance. Um, I, I couldn't really tell from the write-up, like, uh, I think they build it on their own and run it on their own. And there was a bit of a, a tool list of things that they used, which you can see here. But obviously, as a vendor, it would be much better if they decided to uh, get Tanzu for it. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I've been able to transfer money successfully. They, um, there's, 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 I, know, I know the people that they could talk to if they're interested in doing more, they'd probably talk to them. But more to the point that I'm trying to make here is in this instance, when, when the, the bank decided to build their own thing, they realized they needed a centralized way of doing it, right? Like all of the, all of the efficiencies and then the governance that they wanted, let's, maybe we could co go back, let's call it collaboration. The collaboration they wanted to achieve uh, instead of having developers build this on their own, they needed operations to uh, build that platform and uh, provide it out. And 
I don't know, seems to work for them uh, in, in this case. Now, I think both of these instances, there's one key thing that's always worth thinking about. Lots of talks and, and uh, conversation on this. But in both these instances and every other one, there is a shift that goes on when you're providing this, this platform, right? And that is uh, that I think the, I call them operations, but let's say infrastructure, system, and whatever, the people who are not the developers who are responsible for running your infrastructure or, uh, I don't know, they're not the ones doing the UIs and the applications, whatever you may think of that. But the shift that I see in their thinking is when they're providing these platforms, they think about developers as their customers. They think about creating a product. Now, we've got a nifty phrase for this in pivotal Tanzu land, which is platform as a product. And this part is vital because one of the reasons developers like to build their own platforms is they're often forced to use a centralized platform, and it might be cool for the first six months, but immediately something cooler has come out out there in the world, and they file a ticket to add this new feature. And very often, I mean, you know what it's like when you file a ticket. Often when you file a ticket, the answer you receive is a very elaborate multi-day ticket version of, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, so it's almost like when you have this service mentality, uh, if you're providing a service, uh, and this is, I think, the trap that ESBs and SOAs and all these things fell into, that enterprise architectures fell into, is you're delivering to a set of requirements, uh, a set of capabilities. And what you essentially say is if someone wants us to update it and add new features, that's not really, I don't, I don't really care right? Like my customers, the capabilities and the requirements that I have, the service that I'm delivering. And this is just some weird one-off thing that developers have that people have requested. And so I'm going to figure out some reason to uh, tell them no. I mean, this is kind of a fundamental uh, rule of human behavior uh, that if someone asks you to do something different, your immediate impulse is probably going to be to methodically use your maximum capacity and brain power, everything at your disposal to tell them no, right? Because that would require you to do something different and expend some energy that uh, you didn't decide on yourself. Back to that, it's, you know, everyone thinks you're a lunatic thing. But what I see with organizations, and, and Rajesh does a good, uh, in all the th places he's talked, he talks about this as well. And you see this kind of poke out from uh, Fellow's piece here comes up over and over again there's numerous cases of this is and when when I would work with the BT people it was great to see them doing this uh, but they start thinking about those developers those product teams as their customers so instead of saying no they take more of a product manager attitude and they think about if someone's asking me to do something or telling me something that's wrong in my system in the container platform that I'm providing this is a good sign right it's I've discovered a way that I can differentiate my platform, something good that I can do for people. And instead of saying no, I need to prioritize that. Now, that can be a little bit of a trick. You can prioritize it down a black hole of never happening. But you instead think about, is this something that will actually make their lives better, that will make the process better? And having that mentality where you're not just responding to uh, delivering a service or that more like IT, ITSM, IT service management and delivery me mentality, but really thinking about product managing your platform, I think that becomes uh, an especially important shift because what it means is that you're looking to be relevant and important and evolve that platform. And then hopefully you don't get stuck in the ditch of uh, the old standardized middleware stack that no one uh, ever wants to use, which I think to be fair, that'll happen every five or eight years. And uh, you just got to make a concerted effort to uh, de-legacy the, uh, the platform that you have, which, which is fine. That's the, the, the natural uh, sort of course of thing. So then finally, uh, the other thing I wanted to pull from, if you look at the CNCF survey, I wanted to see, uh, you know, what are people, what sort of layers do, do, do are people using? And I, I, this would be nicer. I bet if I dug around in some other like Gartner and, and Forrester and, and other reports, I'd see more of a split between if your if your application is running on containers, are you know are developer how much are developers managing it on their own? And you can see I forget the 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 date this was done, but you can kind of see an idea of the the container management orchestration layers that people in a cloud native computing foundation, the CNCF survey, said that they were doing and. Uh, a lot of a lot of it is just uh, working directly uh, with with the platform on its own, but but not all of them. I don't know. I don't really like this chart so much. Not least of which, 
because VMware doesn't show up. VMware Tanzu doesn't show up on it, but what are you going to do? Uh, but I, I think it is uh, an interesting chart. I guess there was a, a Forrester wave recently that went over. It was a way, what was it? Is one of these very precise thing, multi-cloud container platforms. So I should probably go read up on that one and see kind of what what their position on all of this stuff is. But anyways, going back to the original notion, right? Like, does it, do we have a crisis of Bruin uh, that, that these developers are running wild doing too many things? And I'm not really sure if, if like, that's the case yet, right? Like, I don't, uh, I saw some other estimate of... Uh, some one of the um, one of the VC types over at um, <clears throat> the uh, the the Dell VC firm. Uh, I forget what it's called. Dell Ventures. He's, he's, I I think I actually talked with him a couple times. He was one of the Quest people, and uh, he had uh, he had one of these like in IDE uh, sort of like public cloud uh, SLDC you know development workflow things. <coughs> I forget who ended up acquiring that. But anyways, he had an estimate of the number of developers out there and you've got like, you know, 24, 27 million globally. And and I guess the question is like, are are 1% of them like doing this, uh, paying attention to Kubernetes too much and building their own thing? Or is it more like 40% of them? And it would be nice to get some precision on how much of a crisis there is. Now, uh, based on what I see, definitely, if you were to take the uh, the global 2000, right, and then, you know, the 2000 largest organizations when it comes to IT and doing their own development across the world, then I always like to say, you know, throw in all the government organizations and militaries and other things like that as well. Um, I think most all of those organizations are thinking about uh, what are we going to do for a container platform, Um and of course, you know, many of them, uh, as they should be doing, are considering, should, is, is it best to build it on its own? Is it best to use an off-the-shelf thing, a distro of it? Should we use a public cloud one? What should we do, right? Like, hopefully, if you're in one of those organizations, you're figuring out, you're doing, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say thorough in the sense of take three years to do it, but like a thorough POCing of each of those things. Now, another tip from another Dutch bank, Rabobank here, is like, the way that you should be POCing those things is uh, not just making you a bunch of like spreadsheets and uh, having meetings and having people with titles like CTO and, you know, nothing against CTO, but I've been involved in lots of these processes where they just kind of like people off in analysis land or doing their own thing and deploying stuff. But you want to find some actual developments who developers who work on actual software and just have them trial out each of these platforms. And I don't know, maybe ask them which one they like the best instead of kind of doing a feature matrix way of doing it. And that was, uh, again, like Rabobank did this with when they were doing uh, bake-offs between all of their container platforms. This is about three or four years ago now, but you should do things that way. Anyways, all these organizations, uh, hopefully they're going through evaluating what they want their platforms to be. And that's more of like, I think, where effort like this should be spent, uh, which really does go back to the original thing of uh, one day, it would be fun to investigate what's the deal with serverless. Because uh, I think that is like, there's been a lot of discussion over, of that over the years. And I think um, in that CNCF survey, there is some serverless uh, stuff going on. But I still don't get the sense that that is like the end all and be all of how things should be done. I don't know. I don't have a good handle on like what actually happens there and how widespread it is. Like when I when I open up, uh, ABN, like my uh, my landlord wanted me to help pay some taxes uh, recently, which is fine. So I had to transfer some money. Transferring money in Europe, if you're off in the States, transferring money in Europe is awesome. Like it's really easy. If you've ever, ever tried to just transfer money account to account in the States or America, it's really hard. It's ridiculous. Now, you, there's a whole overlay of people to do that. Anyways, so, you know, when I open up my ABN app and do their... Uh, that whole process. I don't know, is serverless involved in there? Like it'd be fun to, to see how much serverless is involved in the day-to-day -day software uh, that, that we're doing. But that's that, that would be a good thing for another time, right? Like what uh, what's the deal with serverless? Well, I think that's a good, a good spot to wrap up. Uh, you know, I think, I think there's, you know, I, I think what I would like to start going over is kind of like content that's happened, but I haven't really gotten that organized yet. 
I think uh, as far as coming up, uh, I'll try to do at least one of these. It's kind of fun, actually. Maybe I'll do one tomorrow. We'll see. But I'll do one at least on Tuesday at 11 a.m., you know, Central European time, Amsterdam time, if you will. And uh, I believe, uh, let me check on the old uh, schedule here. I think that I might have something scheduled on uh, Monday. Uh, I don't formally but I think, uh, yeah, Rita and I don't actually have a uh, an idea of something to talk about on uh, Monday the 28th. I'll find out. Uh, but, you know, every now and then we have uh, a recording there. Now, also on, on the streaming thing here, uh, you should go over, if you haven't looked at the schedule that we've had, you know, I assume if you're watching this uh, live, you know how to get to uh, twitch.com slash uh, VMware Tanzu. You can also put a .tv in there, whatever. But we've got a pretty full bevy of shows there. Mark Heckler just started one out, just kind of uh, checking in. I think he calls it code. He just he just sat down for like ninety minutes and like messed around doing code stuff, which, which, actually, it's very calming to watch. I didn't, wasn't really paying attention to, but for me, it was nice. It's like ambient coding. We, maybe he should uh, call it that. That would be fun. I could call mine, you know, ambient nonsense. Uh, but that's coming up. Uh, you can see that in the schedule. And then I think also uh, Nate. Uh, Nate is uh, starting kind of more of a architectural design sort of interview show on Monday. On Mondays, if you're into that. And then, uh, I don't know. That's about it. So I'll, uh, I don't know. I'll take these notes here. I don't really know where, where to post them. But for now, I will... Uh, what I'll do is I'll put them on my own blog, which is at Kote.io. And if you go to Kote.io slash notebook, uh, I'll put a link there and you can kind of look it up and, uh, and find it. And uh, with that, we'll see everyone next time. Be sure to send me any ideas of, of things that you want or feedback so I can uh, continually hone this. I mean, if you, if you think it's terrible and you don't like it, just don't tell me that. It's like sometimes uh, I'll, I'll uh, it happens less than it used to, but it used to be often I would give my my son, some, some food that I had given him. And he would say, to be honest, I don't like tomatoes. And so what I started telling him is that if you find yourself starting a sentence off with, to be honest, just stop talking. I don't want to hear your honesty. Uh, and if you feel the need to kind of like tell me if you, that, you know, to be honest, I didn't like it, it's okay. You don't have to tell me. I, I will assume that because you haven't told me, you didn't like it. That's that's fine. So only tell me positive things and ideas you want because, you know, <clears throat> I got enough challenges in life and people being honest with me. I, I don't I don't need more. In fact, I, I could have as long as as long as you're saying good things to me, be as dishonest as you want. That's totally cool. Or you can be genuine uh, if it's good. So on that note, bye bye.